Hi everyone, uh, this is Richard speaking. I'm glad to have you with us this morning or this afternoon, whichever your time zone might be. Sitting to my right here is uh, Chris Triplo, who is our Operations Manager for conducting ride quality tests. So between the two of us at the end of our presentation, hopefully we can answer your questions and in the meantime uh, we'll give you some uh, information that you'll hopefully find interesting on ride quality and uh, what you need to know about it. So what we're going to consider today is uh, three main points, I guess. Uh, one is what is ride quality itself and how does it relate to uh, the roughness of the road. Our second question is we're going to look at how ride quality is measured because by understanding this, oh, it will actually help you uh, in having pavements that end up being smooth and as I said how can a basic understanding of IRI lead to a road with a smoother ride. So we're not going to talk so much about uh, how you go about uh, constructing a, a smooth road and how uh, deep layers of uh, sub bases should be and uh, seal coats and the like but by understanding the principles of how ride quality is measured, by understanding the, the model of IRI and how that's measured well, we're taking those in, things into account that when you do build your roads or even prepare them for testing, uh, you, you can end up with a much smoother ride. So what's ride quality then? Well, basically it's the level of comfort that someone experiences within a vehicle as it travels over a pavement. And that has a lot to do with how smooth or rough the pavement is but it also has a bit to do with how good the suspension characteristics of the vehicle are as well. But we're going to uh, focus on the pavement today. So ride quality is also directly related to the vertical uh, acceleration that the people within the vehicle experience. Now to the right of the screen you'll see a picture of uh, a young man. He's been uh, tied up to a, a chair that's uh, well, it's very. It's got a lot of instrumentation on it, accelerometers and the like. And basically, this was an army project. And what they did was they took him and they shook him up, and they shook him down to the side, all over the place. And uh, they try to work out what frequencies of it and uh, at what frequencies the accelerations he experienced actually caused him discomfort. So at low accelerations, at, say at five hertz, well, that's a really bad frequency to experience because it starts to shake up your insides, your, your heavy, bigger body organs within you, your liver and the like. So uh, it makes it very uncomfortable if you're in a vehicle in a road that's doing that to you. And if you're at much higher vibrations uh, where you might get chatter on the road where it's uh, you know, hard to steer and if you actually get high enough uh, vibrations above that, you know, things like your eyeballs even can start to, uh, to bounce around. So that's this gentleman's claim to fame many years ago. He, uh, they developed some good uh, ride quality or acceleration curves based on his response to being shook up and down a lot. So the acceleration, of course, when it comes to ride quality is attributable to the, the roughness of the pavement. Now roughness has a definition. There's the different societies, whether it's ASTM in the States or ISO or here in Australia, they all have a similar definition of what road roughness is and basically it's anything uh, on a pavement surface that deviates from what it's intended to be and that that characteristic affects the dynamics of the vehicle travelling over it. So it can uh, then that way it affects things like ride quality and the dynamic load on the pavement. So if you want a simple version of what roughness is, it's just a lack of smoothness. And if you talk to people from the US, they don't actually use the term roughness. What they'll do is just call it smoothness, I guess because it has a, a much more positive connotation than, than roughness does. So just a couple of reasons why we go about measuring ride quality. Uh, one thing it does is reduces the dynamic loading of vehicles traveling over the pavement on the pavement itself. You can imagine, especially with heavy vehicles, if uh, the uh, uh, suspension is excited and it starts to raise, come down again, that the load that it, it can uh, put on the the, uh, the pavement itself is much more than the, maybe the 20 or 30 or whatever 10 tons is over the axle and even double. So 
you know, it can dynamically load the pavement and lead to early failure. It increases life expectancy. Uh, I should qualify that for the pavement, not, not for those who travel over it, but uh, decreases road user costs. If we're running over rough roads all the time, there's more wear and tear on the vehicle. You've got to get it serviced more. You'll use more, new, more fuel and the like. And one of the larger reasons why ride quality is important because it increases the user satisfaction. Uh, no one likes it when you travel over a new bit of road and uh, you feel it's rough as guts. Maybe you've got to travel that bit of road on the way to work and back home. You think, well, you know, there's a lot of money spent here fi fixing this road. What for? You know, I, I don't enjoy driving over it. So if we can get a smooth ride and the road doesn't become part of uh, something that annoys you while you're traveling, you know, you've got a good job done there. And then I guess for, for many of us online today and listening to this, uh, why is ride quality important? Well, it's because you as contractors, you have to uh, rehab the road or newly construct a piece of, of road and the state road agencies or authorities have implemented ride quality specifications. You have to make it to a certain ride quality level. Okay. So we talked a bit about ride quality and what it is. How do we go about measuring it? Well, uh, today predominantly, and uh, we'll talk a little bit, there's other ways of measuring it as well, but we use an inertial laser profiler. And that's something that was introduced into Australia in the late 1980s by a gentleman. He's down in the left-hand corner here, Dr. Hans Prem. And uh, in fact, that's the first laser profiler the three lasers on the front that was developed here in Australia. So over the years, of course, things have changed a little bit and you've got much newer, more modern systems with many more lasers and which measure much more than just roughness. But uh, that's what we want to focus on, just uh, their ability to measure roughness. And they do this in particular. Their main function is to measure the longitudinal profile of, file of the pavement because it's from that profile that we actually get our indication of the roughness of the road. So these profilers, that's exactly what they do, measure the longitudinal profile in the wheel paths, which by definition is about, well, there's one and a half metres between these sensors for measurement, and it's, so it's 750 centimetres either side of the centre of the vehicle there. So, yeah. So here's a schematic of an inertial laser profile, courtesy of the little book of uh, profiling, which is published by UMTRI, or the University of Michigan Transport Research Institute. Just looking at the different components, uh, we have an accelerometer that sits above the laser, and what this does, it sets up an inertial reference, and they're really good at measuring long wavelengths. So it can tell us, you know, if the road is going up or down, uh, and it picks that up to a certain degree, and it sets up what we call this inertial reference. Now, uh, to be able to do that, the profile has to be going at least, say, 15 to 20 kilometres an hour, because you need to have some speed for it to, to work properly in that regard. Now, we also need to combine that measurement with a uh, reading from a laser, which looks at the, uh, the height from that inertial reference to the reference to the surface of the pavement. We also need to be able to measure distance and take samples of the longitudinal profile at equal uh, lengths, and that's at, at 25 millimetres or maybe 50 millimetre sampling. And taking all that information, we can uh, integrate and differentiate and the like, and we end up with a profile of the pavement surface. Now, that profile, and we won't get too much into it. It's not exactly the same as what you get from a rod and level because that'll give you exactly, uh, you know, if a, a hill, if you're surveying a hill and it's 20 metres high, it's going to tell you it's 20 metres high. This inertial profile will measure uh, that the wavelengths only maybe up to 30 metres. It'll show you that you're going up a hill a little bit, but it won't have a 20 metre displacement or anything like that. But uh, that's getting into it in a, in a bit too deep maybe for our presentation today. So many of you may have seen one of these laser units. If you're a constru in the construction industry, you'll see one of them come out to site to test your uh, rehab or your new construction. Usually it's covered, though. There's a beam uh, 
here we go with uh, the lasers within it. What's actually behind the beam is something like this. Uh, this is just a typical laser unit which uh, has a, a laser source and then it's got a camera and basically it works on the principle of triangulation. So the laser source generates a, a beam that uh, hits the pavement and then depending on whereabouts the reflection of that beam is uh, focused on this laser photodiode uh, that correlates to a, a height. So uh, each laser will have a probably a 200 millimeter measurement range, maybe 250 millimeter measurement range. And this standoff simply means what's the distance from the bottom of the laser to where the, the measurement range starts. So you really have to be bouncing severely around and it doesn't really happen uh, to, to get your laser uh, to be measuring out of, out of range. So what is this IRI? It's the International Roughness Index and that's really the outcome of a World Bank initiated uh, project back in Brazil in 1982. It's called the International Road Roughness Experiment. And the idea there was, well, you know, especially in developing nations, how can we come up with a measure of the condition of the, the pavement or the, the roads they're building that can give us an indication of their smoothness. So uh, that's where it stemmed from and there was a lot of earlier work done to, um, in the States prior to that. But basically it consists of a quarter car model. So it's just as the name suggests, it's a model that uh, models the, the, a quarter car of uh, one wheel of a vehicle. And, uh, it emulates the body mass, the uh, suspension system, and the axle mass and then the tyre is uh, modelled as an actual spring. So what we need to do is we take the measured profile, we run this model or filter over it and what comes out is the IRI. And why it's good for ride quality, an assessment of ride quality, and you might remember back to our introduction we talked about ride quality involves the accelerations that people feel in the vehicle that makes us feel uncomfortable or not. And certainly at a, a model speed of 80 kilometres an hour. So let's just get this clear. Some people think that you've got to collect this data at 80 kilometres an hour in your profiler for it to be valid. That's not true. Your profiler can travel at uh, usually a range of speeds, maybe between 15 and 100 kilometres an hour to collect the profile. It's the, the 80 kilometres an hour refers to the speed that this model runs over that profile. And then 80 kilometres an hour, it relates well, or correlates well to what a person would feel uh, travelling along in a vehicle on that pavement. So again, this is the connection back to the profiler. The profiler measures the profile, and then we run this computer model over it, and we get the international, ride, uh, international roughness index. Sorry. So here's a little scale that you might have seen if you're familiar with it in different publications about what you can expect. Uh, airport runways and super highways are, are very smooth and um, you know we've seen many jobs actually that aren't runways or uh, sorry highways or freeways that are actually smooth now. Isn't that right Chris? I think it's not uncommon if you sort of get a half or below one, one IRI. So uh, a lot of uh, contractors obviously taking this information to heart and being able to produce some uh, really smooth pavements. But it gives you an, an indication of what that range is meant to be with the different IRI values. But certainly anything under two is, is pretty smooth, anything under one exceptional. And as we've seen uh, for some hundred metre sections down to half IRI, which is uh, pretty, pretty amazing. Of course, for a perfectly flat road uh, with no undulations, no, sorry, no defects on it, no forms of roughness, you would get a zero, but that hasn't happened as yet. Not that we've measured anyway. So I've talked a lot about uh, the International Roughness Index. Now, some of you might come from states where uh, NASRA roughness counts uh, the, um, the unit or measure of roughness rather than IRI. Uh, the two are related, directly correlated, uh, because before profilers were around, um, all the roughness testing was done by the uh, NASRA roughness meter, 
Here's a picture of it in the back of the uh, test vehicle from the, uh, the, the 80s. Got some weights we had to weigh down the back. Uh, there's a chain here that only moves in one direction and with a spring and then there's a cable that goes down to the diff on the car. So an ASRA meter would measure the separation of the axle to the body of the car and that would turn this clutch up here which would generate count. So every, I think it was 15.2 millimetres of movement related to one uh, roughness count. Now why a profiler is much better than a NASRA meter is that it, a profiler uh, isn't susceptible to changes in things like tyre pressure, suspension deterioration and the like. With the NASRA meter you had to calibrate it and that's the whole reason laser profilers were first developed in, in Australia was to be a calibration tool for the NASRA meter. So if operated correctly, uh, a laser profiler yeah, doesn't need to be calibrated every 2,000 kilometres or 3,000 kilometres as was the old NASRA meter. So with a NASRA meter, if your road, if you did the same, measured the same piece of road and, uh, over a two month period and you hadn't calibrated it right and there was a difference in, in results, you didn't know that was because the road had changed or whether your NASRA meter was out of calibration. But anyway, that's, that's a bit of history. What's really good to know is that the, uh, with all that initial testing done in the 80s, we do have a direct relationship between NASRA and IRI and so that we can generate NASRA counts from the IRI calculated from the longitudinal profile. So that way uh, historical data wasn't lost and the like and we can report NASRA today uh, that way. So I'd certainly um, recommend it be done this. I'm not too sure of too many NASRA meters still running around the place. Uh, we certainly haven't calibrated any for many, many years. So I just want to talk a little bit about roughness and what it is. Because some have the preconceived idea that, you know, roughness is all about you know, potholes in the road or corrugations or, you know, imperfections. Well, that, that, that's true. That's part of it. And we call those type of things point defects or, you know, localised defects as you see on the road here. But roughness in terms of the International Roughness Index is also undulations in the pavement that are of much longer wavelengths. We're going to talk about the IRI model in a little more detail and it measures out in response to wavelengths that are up to 30 metres in length or actually even more. So this road here, it could have a super, it's in New Zealand on the South Island by the way, might be a very smooth surface, it doesn't have any potholes or corrugations but it's a pretty rough road as you look along the line mark. Here on the left hand side you can see the roads going up and down. Probably wasn't built that way. It's probably uh, because of the expansive clays or the, uh, there and over time uh, the, the deviation in the pavement has occurred. So keep this in mind, roughness is, as we said, these localised things to the longer wavelengths and everything in between. So if we understand that, that can be beneficial for us when we are uh, certainly taking measurements and, and building our roads. So when it comes to doing ride quality testing, and on uh, new construction or rehabs, whatever it might be. There's things that you've got to look out for that if you do, you can end up with a smoother, uh, well, better ride quality. So that what we're going to talk about now for the next few minutes is uh, the effect of what steps and construction joins can have on your IRI that you measure on your, your sites that you're working on. I'm going to look at dips, humps and bumps really to show you that Roughness is more than just these point defects, but longer wavelengths can have a big effect. Uh, how simple housekeeping things like keeping the road clean before you go out and test it uh, for ride quality can benefit you greatly. Uh, you need to often provide good information about site location and delineation, especially for unsealed surfaces. The need for uh, lead in and lead out, which is something particular that uh, laser profilers need. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about unsealed pavements and, and wet pavements as well. So uh, funnily enough, Osteroads has a definition of what a step in a pavement is. So oh, it's a change in height at a discrete point. So what we call that is a short duration effect and we've seen it happen on many occurrences that are something like a bridge abutment 
or the termination of an overlay or where you know uh, one construction job um, ends and the old pavement begins or maybe between uh, seals have been put down on the same construction job. So just give you an indication of what the effect of a st the step heights can be on the IRI. So here's a uh, picture. Be, actually, if anyone can send in some more recent pictures, uh, uh, would be really good because uh, I've had to scrounge to get some uh, examples that go back many a year. But here, here's an example of uh, it looks like an asphalt overlay being put on. Now that's not to say that here this is going to what it's going to end up at the end of the uh, the job like this. But you can see that there's a, a step between the, the pavement, old pavement, and the new seal going on here. Now, what would be the effect on the IRI uh, if this step had the following heights in the table below? So what I've done here is I've just taken a perfectly flat 100 metre section of road. I've modelled that and I've put a step at the 50 metre marks. So I've put a step of 5 mil, 10 mil, 15 up to 25 mil. And what kind of IRI will I get? Well, with a 5 mil step, that 100 metres is going to have an IRI of 0.17. And then because IRI is a linear response, well, it's just going to double or increase for 10 mil. For 15, it's going to um, put another 0.17 on and so on and so on. So the point is that you know, if this step can really add to the IRI that's measured on your, your pavement. Now, as we said, no one's really come up with being able to produce a, a perfectly flat pavement. So if your step is within a 100 metre uh, section uh, and you report it over that 100 metres, it's not necessarily going to say that 0.86 is going to be added on to your IRI, but at the worst case it will. But we're just trying to highlight that it will have a negative effect on your IRI and your IRI will be higher. So when you're putting your, your uh, surfaces down, and again, here's another older picture, but I think you'll get the idea of um, you need to utilise continuous pavement techniques. You don't want any discontinuities or any uh, deviations in that surface uh, due to uh, the way you're putting that seal down. And as someone pointed out, you wouldn't want the supply truck uh, with the asphalt bumping the paver. Uh, otherwise, they're going to put a little more than you wanted down at that point or maybe uh, it puts a little less. But if it puts a bump in the pavement, well, it's going to have, a, it's going to increase your IRI at that point. So here's some examples of uh, some of these joints are, are pretty nice here, but there's, it looks like there's a little bit of a dip in the road here. That's going to increase your roughness. Here there's a bit more of a, a step even, a small step. That's going to increase your roughness. And here, there's a yeah, this might actually be a bridge joint here. That's going to have an effect on your roughness as well. And as an example of this, I think Chris, uh, you gave us this from one of the jobs you did. Uh, can you remember where it is? Just that one, maybe in uh, Geelong. Okay. So as you can see, maybe this is a, an, um, a seal on on the bridge deck itself going onto the road. There's a change in seal though. You can see. Here's a roughness at 10 metre level on the, uh, the right of your screen now. You can see at this, this point here, uh, we're just coming up. The blue highlighted part is just before we get to the uh, join. And you see the next figure, we've gone from 2.5 to 5 IRI just because of this join. And then it settles down a little bit and gets quite a bit smoother after. So there's an example of how uh, the, uh, the join itself in real life has increased the roughness measured over that section of road. Now it won't be so obvious over the 100 metres, which uh, it's reported at, but you can see it's certainly going to add to your, your roughness. And that's something really that the contractors and the superintendent of the job have got to discuss. Are these things included in our outputs or, or do we get some leniency uh, due to uh, you know this, this fact that in some cases if you've got to put a joint, joint in there, say something like this, you know, it's always going to have a, an effect on your roughness. And here you can see it, it's even more highlighted. Is that, is that Eastlink? No, it's Geelong. Geelong again, OK. So a great smooth bit of road here on the, on the right down to 1.1. And then we get this joint, bang, 5.6, 7.32. And then uh, once we get over the, the join and the seal change, it starts to smooth off again until there's another bridge joint up here. So we're just trying to highlight that fact. 
uh, things like joints, bad seals and like can really affect your roughness and that'll have an effect on your write quality. So we'll move on and back to our uh, longer wavelength defects in pavements. We call them dips, dips humps and bumps. So, um, you know, typically this is a result of what's built into the underlying layers. Is it hasn't happened um, just over time. As we said, expansive soils can do this to erode uh, surface. But, um, you know, if your road looks like this, even if you test it prior to putting on your seal, that, well, you're not going to see really any improvement in the ride quality once the seal goes down because this longer wavelength is going to dominate the IRI that's measured and your ride quality will be pretty high. So you really need to use some sort of shape correction in that case. So just to, to highlight this, I just want you to imagine a road that's a perfect sine wave. So the surface of this road is like a billiard table, okay? It's perfect. It's got absolutely no defect. It's got a 20 meter wavelength. The amplitude is only 10 millimeters, so it goes up and down only 10 millimeters. That's not much when you look at it, one centimeter. And as I said, absolutely no surface defects. It's perfectly smooth on this shape. Now, do you think that you're going to get a low IRI? And this, this is really highlighting this point that roughness isn't just these little surface defects like potholes and, and corrugations. In fact, you're going to get an IRI of 2.34 out of that surface. So just think about that. It's perfect. There's no defects on the surface. It's like a billiard table. But just that 10 millimeter amplitude every going up and down over 20 meters, and you're going to get an IRI of 2.34. So that's certainly something that you don't, you don't want to build in uh, a wavelength like that into your pavement. And that's because, and this is about as technical as we go today, um, it's called the IRI gain response curve. But basically, uh, what you want to do is, these are two wavelengths. It's about two and a half meters, and this is, uh, I think it's 15 meters. Now, if you had those wavelengths built into your pavement, uh, they are really going to send the, the IRI up. This is where they'll magnify the amplitudes by one and a half, and you'll get maximum roughness. So you never want to build in wavelengths like that into your pavement. You want them to be down near one or, or below. And I guess as an example of this, uh, you can imagine, and I guess we've moved into the modern age and use la laser leveling for our, um, for our, um, what am I thinking of, Chris? Um, for our, uh, our heights, instead of using, um, you know, in the old days, and maybe some still use it, you're using your pegs and then a string line to guide your paver. Now imagine if you had a peg every 12 and a half metres or 15 metres and the string line had a bit of a droop in it and you started to build in that shape into your, your pavement, well, you're going to get a really uh, big high IRI. So they're wavelengths you, want, you really want to avoid. Now something that is really easy to do but doesn't get done all the time is just prior to a ride quality test, clean your surface because uh, surface contaminants can have a significant effect on the result that you'll get. Now, uh, these are real life examples. I think this was down on the uh, Hallam Bypass. And if, imagine this, if we were testing this bit of surface and the, uh, on the far right there with a clump of clay, uh, in this one wheel path, the laser runs over it, it's going to see that as a step. Um, now, and it, the IRI is going to increase. You know, so imagine you know, he might actually miss that, but if the laser does get it, well, it's going to give you an inflated IRI value, all because the surface wasn't cleaned off. And uh, as I said, these are all examples here from actual jobs where um, maybe not enough care has been taken prior to having the right quality test uh, done. Because as it says there, the, the machine, it can't tell the difference between a hunk of dirt or the pavement. Now, if you've got a... Uh, a a good operator, well, of course, he's going to try and uh, miss that clump of clay or the like. But if it's so dirty that you can't help but hit it, well, it's going to affect your result. So a simple thing to do is just sweep and clean the uh, things like loose gravel, dirt and clay from the surface prior to the testing. So really, it's just good housekeeping. Another thing that we've seen from time to time is uh, 
uh, well, a lack of uh, location information and delineation. Now, sometimes we're asked to go out and do a job and it's very obvious where the start and end of the job is because it's a new section of road and you've got a different surface and the like. So you, you've got a rough indication it's you know, 23.7 k's down on the Geelong Road. Uh, that's where we want you to test to the end of that section. But in other instances, that's not always the case. So it's a bit harder if only a particular section of a, a road needs to be done. And um, you know, if there's no one out there to show the tester where he needs to test from and to, well, you, you might have them testing um, well, extra bits of road or not the, exactly the same bit. So some marks, some paint marks, some bollards or something uh, to assist in start and end points and even tracking, especially on unsealed pavements. Sometimes um, too we have to return and, re and redo the same um, uh, lane, say, after the road has been open to traffic for a period of time. Now if we tested here on this one on the left, we have no idea where the lanes are going to be in the end. So when we come back and the lane markings down, you know, we might be comparing uh, testing from over here with what's over here now. This is a good example actually of an unsealed on the right. You can't see it very well, but the, uh, the contractor actually did mark a centre line for us when we were testing so that uh, the driver was able to drive in a, in a repeatable manner. So they're just a, a couple of things that, again, uh, aid you in getting uh, the uh, more accurate results. Now with uh, profilers, I mentioned earlier that really they need to be up to a minimum speed to, to work properly and it's about 15 kilometres now. You like it to be a little higher than that, maybe 20. So uh, what you really like to do is have what we call lead-in. So in this example, this is a very bad example, this is again the Helen Bypass, uh, it's been blocked off with a fence, we can only get back maybe 20 metres before uh, the start of the site. So there's no way we can start actually collecting at that point. We probably start another 20 or 30 metres down the road because we have to get up to speed. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that the model, the quarter car model needs to initialise itself so it needs this lead in to do that. Otherwise it can have an effect on your uh, result that you get. So everything wants to happen before you get there. So as a minimum we would suggest 20 metres uh, ideally. You know, as much as you can, 50 metres. And you know, in some instances this just can't be done and that's when you probably need to look at using another device such as a walking profiler uh, and we'll show you a picture of one of those in a second. So you also want to make sure that um, your lead-in is free of you know, bridge, jo bridge joints and the like because they're going to have an effect. And we call that the flow-on effect. Remember I showed you the little table about uh, putting steps in, a, in a, fl a perfectly flat 100 metre section of, of pavement. This is what it looks like um, on a 10 metre level uh, for each of those steps. So you can imagine this is a step. Uh, as I said, it's a, IRI is linear, so each of these is just the same amount above the other. But you can see the bigger the step, the longer the effect on the IRI is. So. Um, here the, the uh, step is at 50 metres, the vehicle hits it, and most of things happen 10 metres from there, but as you go on further and further, you're still seeing some effect on the IRI as you get down, down the, uh, further down the road. So that's why if you've got uh, a section of road you're trying to do and there's a joint b before it, well, you know, I know in some instances contractors have been able to negotiate with the superintendent that they cut out the first 30 or 40 metres because the effect of that step or bump will be pretty much dissipated by that point from the report, uh, the result that gets reported. Lead out is something that's not as critical as the lead in, but you know, you want to be able to mm, shut down your acquisition system and avoid the need for sharp deceleration. So, you know, Again, you don't want to have the, uh, the, the uh, survey team jumping on the brakes because they're going to crash off the edge of the pavement or you know, a uh, concrete barrier or something like that that just won't uh, help. So ideally 50 metres, but um, if it's less, um, you can often deal with it as long as they can uh, stop uh, in a realistic fashion. Uh, unsealed roads is, is something that has been of interest. A lot of testing gets done before the final seal goes down because if we, we know that uh, things are done right, if the, um, 
the, the sub base and underlying layers are smooth, well, the seal goes on and it'll be at least as smooth, hopefully, as, as what the, uh, the sub base and, and underlying layers are. Uh, so testing on unsealed roads, all we'll say is we've learnt this by experience and maybe uh, some of you have been involved in this process too. Uh, we've had profilers where the lasers were actually mounted on the rear of the vehicle. Now if there's a lot of dust, um, that affects the measurement results. And I remember a story going back a few years now when we had to test a unsealed site. There was a lot of dust issues and uh, our driver was actually, operator was actually driving the site in reverse to avoid the dust problems. Now you don't really track too well in reverse. So anyway, these days uh, if you get a system to test it's, it's certainly better if it's on the front of the vehicle. And uh, you know the lasers work fine whether it be unsealed or, uh, or a, a paved uh, surface. Now having said that, here on wet pavements uh, a laser isn't going to work so, because it relies on reflection. So you can imagine if a laser hits a puddle of water, poof, it gets reflected all over the place and you get an inaccurate reading. Now with a laser profile if you get an inaccurate reading it never leads to a smoother road it's always going to be rougher. And I will admit that this is one situation where an old NASA meter has an advantage because you can actually use it in wet conditions because uh, the whole vehicle itself is, is, is the ins measurement instrument, if you like. And uh, that's one place that does have an advantage over a laser profiler. So uh, a damp surface, a laser will work as long as there's the definition of damp meaning no freestanding water no water in between the aggregate and the like, uh, you'll, you'll still be able to get a good result with a laser profile. But freestanding water, no, it's not going to work. And as I said, always results in a higher IRI. Okay, so what's going to happen if the surface is too rough? Well, I think most of you here in Victoria will be familiar with the section 180 that VicRoads puts out with their uh, new uh, construction and, their, uh, and the like, uh, you've got to go out and correct it, otherwise penalties may apply. Now, this, one thing I've found of interest of looking into ride quality here in Australia and elsewhere is uh, often in places like the US, you can get actually bonuses if you make a smoother than expected uh, pavement. Here in Australia, we only seem to deal with penalties. So uh, one day maybe uh, we'll, we'll change to rewarding contractors for making smoother roads as well. So what you can do if, if a portion of the road looks like uh, it falls out of spec at the 100 metre level, well, you can analyse the data at a smaller interval like we did on the steps there with every 10 metres and you'll be able to find the offending piece of pavement uh, that needs to be fixed uh, to get your roughness down. And again, as we mentioned, a lot of contractors these days and for the past several years seem to like testing prior to the final application of the surface because uh, it's much easier to rework an unsealed surface than a, a sealed one. So here's a little bit of a case study. Uh, it's a series of photos from a job that was done a while back. I guess I'll run through the five or six slides. Have a quick look at them and, and in your own mind tell us whether the, the contract is on a hiding to nothing here given some of the, the uh, well, the, the pavement. Well, you'll see. Just let me run through it. So I'll go back again. Uh, did you notice anything there that might cause some higher than roughness, uh, higher roughness uh, numbers? Oops. As I go through again, well, here we go. We've gone from there's a step here. It's going to increase the, the, the roughness. There's some bollards up to uh, give us a bit of a direction about where the, uh, the survey team has to, to drive, which is not too bad, but might look a bit different to what the final line marking is. As we go here again, we come to an intersection that's coming across the middle of this um, reseal. Again, there's a little step down here. It's going to add to the roughness. Um, oops, get that thing to work the right way. Oh, yeah, here we go, sorry. <laughs> We've got another one here and then we come out here and there's another little step or join there as well. 
so in that situation, um, unless the, and I think they were, can you remember Chris, what, I think the, uh, there was some good discussion between the uh, contractor and the superintendent where um, some, uh, well the limits were, uh, there were some uh, allowances were made for high roughness numbers because you just can't get that smooth, it's got all those steps uh, in it, it's not going to lead to a, a smooth as possible um, site. Okay, so when it comes to uh, measuring equipment, as I said, really today most people are using a, an inertial laser profiler. Here's what I mentioned uh, earlier, if, say if you've got a short section of road that's only like 100 metres, there's no lead in, no lead out, maybe it's a concrete section or something, you can use a, a manual device such as a walking profiler. It measures the, uh, the profile of the pavement and you just run that profile through the quarter car model and it'll give you the IRI and then if you're interested in getting equivalent NASRA, well you can use the correlation equation to, to generate that. So certainly uh, some suggestions when you uh, do get someone to do your ride quest, uh, quality for you, use someone who's accredited um, and who has a quality system um, that often helps and also uh, you know Ostroads have test methods dealing with the measurement of roughness and other pavement condition parameters. Uh, you can download that test method for free from the Ostroads um, website. There is AGAMT001. It's all about measuring roughness with an inertial profile. So it gives you some further information about what systems should be able to do uh, to measure uh, roughness, IRI and subsequently ride quality. So that brings us to the end of our uh, presentation at least before we ask some question, uh, answer some questions. So really I guess the couple of points that you might like to take out of this is that roughness or the International Roughness Index or if you want to express it as NASRA is a good measure of ride quality. Now it might be perfect but it's certainly an international uh, measurement that everyone knows what it is and it's transportable about um, uh, across state boundaries and also international boundaries. And keep in mind, I guess we try to stress this bit, uh, it's more than just potholes and corrugations. These longer wavelengths can really affect things as well and, and, and bridge joins and seal joins and the like are also going to have an effect on your ride quality and the roughness that's measured. And the whole purpose, I guess, of putting this presentation together, and as I said, we're not telling you how to uh, build the roads per se, but we're telling you about things that you need to avoid building into your roads and if you avoid these things or when you're setting up tests, uh, you're, you can rest assured know that you're going to get the smoothest ride possible and the lowest IRI numbers and the best ride quality. So. There's some contact details. That's the website uh, address for Ostroads if you want to download that report. Of course that information will be in the handout that be uh, e emailed out to all those online today. So I guess now we can uh, look at some of the questions that have um, been posted uh, and that are coming up now. And uh, okay, all right. First one here is uh, from Mervyn Henderson there up in Brisbane. So Mervyn asks, I'm told that IRI doesn't take account of the wavelengths that affect heavy vehicles. Is this true and how can affect this affect the assessment of roughness of heavy vehicles? Well that is pretty much true. Uh, heavy vehicles are going to respond to, well in, in one way yes and one way no. Uh, heavy vehicles respond to much longer wavelengths in the pavement as well which aren't picked up by IRI. So as I said, IRI goes out to about 30 metres, uh, a little bit more actually, but you know, uh, heavy vehicles, depending on the configuration of them, can go out to, to many times that or you know, maybe up to respond to 80 or 90 metre wavelengths. So um, you can, yeah, so there is a relation, but that's why I think a lot of people have been trying to develop a, like a truck ride index that's more specific uh, to truck, uh, right, the, the ride experienced by trucks. Okay, what's the next one Chris, do you want to read that out? 
Uh, we've got uh, Ronan from Borrell in uh, New South Wales. If the profiler is better than the NASRA meter, why is it required to be calibrated whenever used and general calibration every six months? Uh, NASRA requirement is general calibration every 5,000 kilometres. Okay, well that's an interesting one, Ronan. I don't know why you calibrate your NASRA meter, uh, your right profiler every six months. I can understand that you might do a check on it where you, you put like a gauge block under the laser just to see that you're uh, still measuring correctly as part of any good quality system. But uh, that's a lot easier to do than get your uh, NASRA meter out and calibrate it. And 5,000 K actually, the, the, uh, um, I thought it was a little less than that, but I'll go with you. I haven't looked at that standard for a while. But I, I think, you know, calibration uh, in, is kind of, there's verification, there's calibration. A good question, I mean, but um, there's certainly a, a calibration for a NASRA meter is much more extensive than uh, just checking a uh, block height check or the like or a distance calibration check which you have to do uh, for a NASA meter anyway uh, too. Okay, we've got uh, Usman is asking uh, what about other parameters like rutting texture which also represent ride quality? Well, uh, yeah, that, that's, they're certainly important pavement condition parameters but when we specifically talk about ride quality um, you know, unless it's affecting the roughness, um, the uh, you you wouldn't classify them the same thing, or, or unless you're asking whether it does affect the ride quality in some ways. Uh, texture is a really high frequency component, so it, the IRI model uh, that we showed you doesn't actually respond to that such smaller wavelengths. Uh, rutting could, I guess, affect ride quality if there's deep ruts and it you know, affects um, the lateral movement of the vehicle, but really ride quality as defined by IRI and the like is the longitudinal deformation rather uh, than, uh, say, lateral or the like. Uh, we've got uh, Yasmina from DPTI. Hello, Yasmina. Uh, how is dynamic loading cost saving calculated? Is there a standardised approach? Wow, well, that's, that's a tough one, Yasmina. Um, <laughs> That'll take more. I've got to ask a few questions on that one myself. Maybe we'll, we'll uh, get back to you in there. But I'm sure some people have done some, um, some research in, into that one. I just want to go back to this one. Casper from BMD. Can R and Ls be determined from profilometry? I think is that like rod and level? I might just, um, I'm not sure about the terminology. But the, um, the profile of the pavement is picked up by the profiler, but it's not, it has a drift in it, so it's not exactly the same as what you would see uh, from a rod and level uh, surface, yeah. So it, it'll give you over, if you filter that profile from the uh, profiler, you know, it'll give you the right levels maybe to uh, up to 30 metres, but you, you can't uh, then determine. It, it'll show you, as I tried to say earlier, it'll tell you or indicate that the profile will rise you're going up a hill or you're going down a hill, it'll drop, but not, not to the same level as you get from a, a rodden level. Uh, so, no, unless you filtered at, at shorter wavelengths, um, you wouldn't be able to do that. Okay, we've got uh, Andrew asking how accurate is the walking profiler and what length it can be used over. Okay, the, the walking profiler is uh, deemed to be a class one um, IRI uh, measuring instrument, so it's the top, top level that you can, you can get. Uh, now, it can be used, well, I mean, you can, anything you can, uh, shorter distances you can uh, measure a profile over, I guess. It takes a step every 241.3 millimetres, but uh, the one thing I will say, and it's more, the profiler will give you an accurate profile, more like a rod and level. Now, if you wanted to get an equivalent rod and level, you'd use something like the walking profiler, it will do that. Uh, uh, but when it comes to the uh, IRI model, um, you know, you would want to, and you wanted to calculate an IRI, I would think you, you want to have at least 40 or 50 metres uh, length, because the IRI has to initialise itself using that profile. But, you know, for just measuring a profile, you can do it as short as, short as you want. 
Uh, we've got Nelson who's asked, uh, how do you filter data at red traffic lights in an urban environment? From Oricon. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I, I, hopefully during a ride quality uh, you wouldn't have to stop at lights because the road wouldn't be uh, open. But um, no, no, that's the true. Uh, as I said, a profiler, if you're going below 15 kilometres an hour or it's stopped, it can't take valid readings. So if you remember back to that plot of um, the effect of the flow-on effect, basically you'll lose, if you stop at a red light, you'll lose 40 metres of data. Uh, which you, you need to pull out of your results. So uh, how you pull that out, and if it's a ride quality job, you really need to discuss that with your uh, the uh, superintendent of, of the project. Okay, uh, Usman has asked, uh, for gravel roads, what parameters are tested, collected for ride quality measure? Yeah, it's the same. It'll be reported as IRI or the equivalent NASVA roughness uh, results. Uh, Michael has asked, does the IRI include measure, uh, does the IRI include uh, footpaths and bike paths? Mm. If not, what measures of roughness are used for footpaths and bike paths? Ah, okay, this is another interesting question. Kind of like the opposite to the, the one on the truck ride. Uh, you know, you, you can and we have. I think that was you and I, Chris. We uh, <laughs> drove a profiler over uh, a bike track in the last couple of years and generated some mm. uh, IRI values. And you can do that and you'll get an IRI, but how does that relate to someone riding a push bike over the track or uh, you know, pushing a pram or, um, or the like? So same thing for footpaths. So really probably uh, you can get the profile, but which will uh, be good, but we really need to come up with a model for whatever you're, you're trying to model, like a bike you know, roughness index model, uh, if, if you like, to get something more meaningful out of it. Okay, uh, Will from Arv has asked, uh, can the laser profiler measure the longer wavelengths that affect heavy vehicles? Is it just the IRI definition that doesn't take them into account? Yeah, this is, this is a good question. Uh, the second half first, yeah, the definition doesn't take the longer wavelengths into account. That's right, it sort of cuts off at around 30, although it probably goes to 50. It has a little bit of effect on the IRI. But the laser profiler actually measures typically uh, out to about 90, 90 metres or so which will be uh, a lot of the longer wavelengths that affect heavy vehicles. So the, the profiler can be used to collect um, uh, the, the pavement profile for modelling for trucks. It's just about coming up with a, a model that um, you know, takes in those longer wavelengths. Uh, wait a sec, I like this one from Tim Martin here. The profiler gain graph you use, is that typical of most laser profiles? Actually, the gain graph, maybe I didn't make this clear, Tim, is uh, actually the gain for the quarter car model. So that's how the model responds to the different wavelengths. So that's the same for, for everything. Okay, uh, Ronan from uh, Borrell has also asked, does sunlight have an effect on the profiler readings? Because um, reflection is said to affect it. Yeah, I think this would be dependent in some ways on the, the quality of the laser. Um, just talking from our own experience, uh, I showed a picture of the first profile that we had uh, developed here at Arb back in the 80s and um, that used to have um, a cowl or cover around it to uh, protect it from the sunlight so it took its readings in shadows and I know some uh, cheaper laser units do have an effect uh, on, uh, from sunlight and it's something that needs to be taken into account, but it certainly doesn't um, uh, affect all different quality uh, lasers. So certainly the ones we're using are okay. Now having said that too, I don't know if um, someone's talked about sometimes on a brand new road surface, if um, the road is, is very shiny, depending on what materials, it might be, um, I don't know the terminology, but uh, you know, you might want to wait a day or so and open the road to traffic before you actually start taking your roughness readings because uh, a super reflective surface, if it's like a, a mirror or something, is all going to affect your, your laser reading. But typically, um, you know, roads open traffic, that, that doesn't happen on most occasions. Okay. Uh, we've got Casper from BMD in Brisbane asking, what are the different profilometer type available on the market and what are the limitations of some types of uh, not giving roughing? 
Okay, well, I guess um, there's, there's quite a, a, a lot. There's um, profilers that, you know, just with two lasers that will give you your longitudinal profile on each wheel path from which you can get your IRI and your NASRA and the like. Then there's multi-laser units that have, you know, 15 lasers and, and can measure your rutting and also texture and the like. There's some that are just two lasers that will do both roughness and textures. So there's, there's a lot, lot around. Um, it's definitely worth, if you're considering getting one, uh, finding out what's there. I don't want to plug ARB. Of course, well, ARB makes, manufactures them. But certainly uh, a lot of uh, overseas um, ones do too. Um, but th there is, there's a lot of different. They all basically work in the same way. But uh, you know, there's different components. Some have different features. Uh, some might be modular even that you could buy a base level and then add to it later cameras and, and the like. Some some of those pictures we showed from the jobs were actually taken from a camera fitted to our right quality vehicle which is uh, inbuilt into it. So which is a good thing too. So if you do see something untoward in the results from some test, you, you can go back to the images and uh, review them to see if there was a join or or a bridge uh, button or something like that. Uh, Malcolm has asked, uh, would you advise against doing roughness servers in low speed environments at uh, say less than 50 kilometres an hour? Um, I, I guess it depends uh, what you want to do. I mean some people will say, oh look, you, you know, you compute the model there of the IRI, it's, you know, you're travelling this bit of road at 80 kilometres, but you know, everyone does it at 50. Um, now that's true. So the the road wouldn't wouldn't be as rough to someone travelling at fifty as as maybe at eighty, but you know it still does give you a good. Um, you you can if you're doing this say for a local council and you want to see how the road is, you know, deteriorating over time or the like, you can still get a, a historical uh, value of the condition of the pavement that you can use to to monitor the performance of the, of the pavement. So I still think it's it's well uh, worth uh, doing. Some people say, well, why don't you simply just change the model of IRI to, to be at 50 kilometres for urban environments? Well, if we did that, it wouldn't be called the IRI anymore. It would be some new statistic. And people have been talking about that, but uh, nothing has been done on an international scale as yet. Okay, a uh, question from Hiran. Um, given that articulated vehicles are significantly different in dimension compared to a standard vehicle uh, that we use to do laser profiling, is there a different approach to ride quality regarding these types of vehicles? Yeah, well, it's, it's in, in the real world there, there probably should be, you know, because uh, from experience here, you know, from years ago, I remember we we're doing testing, and we come up with um, you know roads that oh this road's pretty rough or smooth. Sorry, the wrong way. And then the guys in the heavy vehicles would go over it, and, and the local Vic Roads region would say, you know, this road we get so many complaints. You know, we got you guys out to test it, and you're telling us it's okay. You know, it's only got an IRI of two, and that's a perfect example because you know that's what a standard vehicle is going to feel, but uh, so it might be fine in that perspective, but for a heavy vehicle who's responding to the longer wavelengths, usually is, is the story, uh, you know, it's rough, rough as guts. Okay, we'll take uh, one final question from uh, David. What kind of improvement can be gained in IRI on thin seal <laughs> resurfacing projects? There seems to be a misnomer. A misnomer that is new seal will fix rideability. Yeah, that's that's a great one. Yeah. As, um, you know, I, uh, I know in Vic Roads in that section 180 there is uh, some research being done that typically if you, you know, put a, um, a, a, it might be, I can't remember if it was a thin seal or an asphalt overlay. Anyway, you can expect some improvement, but you know, it's only like uh, a small percentage, you know, two or three percent in the right quality. A thin seal on a on a road that's got bad, uh, you know, uh, in terms of IRI measurement um, profile on it is is really going to do it next to nothing. It's just sitting on top of the pavement. If there's a lot of longer wavelength defects, it's still going to be rough, rough as guts. So uh, yeah, it is a misnomer that a new seal is going to fix uh, rideability. You know, it might uh, fix um, or add to the life of the pavement. You know. You no more cracking and, and whatnot, but when it comes to ride, that it 
doesn't necessarily equate to um, making massive improvements. And this is why I find it funny sometimes when you look at some of the projects around that you know you've got one company building the the, uh, the base layers and the like, and then you've got the company who are doing the ceiling are actually responsible for achieving the ride quality. And if they get a dodgy sub uh, the base layers, it usually doesn't matter. They put the seal on, they can do a great job. But um, you know, if there's some uh, these wavelengths built into the uh, the sub base, yeah, you, you you're still going to get a rough ride. And then they cop the the, uh, the the penalty, so to speak. Okay. Well, feel free to um, uh, send the questions through via email if you still have further questions. But um, we do need to wrap up now. So it looks like we got through most of the questions, but uh, we'd like just like to say thanks for listening, everyone. Um, hope you, you got something out of it. And if questions come to mind, you feel free to email myself uh, or and uh, or Chris, or, and uh, we can uh, get back to you. And uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.